Home is the one thing in our lives that never changes, right? I mean, we face so much change in life. Our world is constantly changing. Society is constantly changing, and it seems to keep changing faster and faster. Even when we're willing to admit it, we change, don't we? I was in the barber last week, and uh, maybe you noticed, but yeah, I was looking at uh, the hair that my barber cut off on the floor afterwards and thinking to myself, why is she only cutting the gray hair off these days? Hmm. Uh, we change, and maybe we don't always like those changes, but with all the changes that we experience in life, we kind of get the sense that home, really it's a shelter from the onslaught of change. It's, it's, it's the one thing that doesn't change. And we might be thinking of home as the place we go to home to at the end of each day. Uh, we might think of home as where we grew up uh, with our parents. We might think of home as being our home church. And maybe that's one of the reasons why churches struggle with change is because, well, it's, it's kind of the place we expect to shelter us from change. Or we might even be thinking of hometowns. And there again, maybe sometimes towns have difficulty changing too. It's a, that we don't like to see change and we think of home as being that refuge from change, that shelter from the onslaught of change. So home, it never changes, right? Well, unless you are Moses, or actually, unless you are most of us. Uh, yeah, we experience change even in our what we consider to be home, what we consider to be unchanging. Yeah, even that changes for us. And let's think of Moses for a moment, that his home changed. Let's, let's think, if we were to ask Moses, what is home for you? What would you say is the, the, the thing that is stable for you that does not change? Uh, we might think he, uh, he, perhaps he'll answer, well, I was born amongst the Hebrew people, so that's my home amongst those people. Or he might respond, well, my earliest memories are growing up in a palace in Egypt uh, with the Egyptians, with the elite, and growing up, spending many years there, up right through his teenage years, uh, where he grew up. And many of us think of home as where we grew up. So maybe Moses would think of that. Or maybe he would think of uh, moving to Midian and the wilderness there and making his home there amongst a completely different people and a completely different place. And yet, while he's making a new home there, God calls him to actually go back to the Hebrew people and, act, and lead them from where they had made their home in Egypt to a new home in the Promised Land, a home actually which Moses would never step foot in. So actually, for the last 40 years of his life, he spent wandering through the wilderness, uh, pitching his tent basically here, there, and everywhere. He never really had a stable home. He was just, when you think of Moses' life, he was constantly just pitching his tent in different places and even with different peoples. Uh, so Moses, what is home for you? And Moses, what would be the one thing in your life that has not changed, that shelter from the onslaught of change? What would that be for you? And actually, when we think of the answer to that question, how Moses would respond, we can think of it as being not only something that was true as he lived, but even today, that Moses could answer today, yeah, this is the one thing. This is, this is where home is. This is where there's a shelter from change. And what is it? Well, you probably can guess the answer. It's God. God was the one thing in Moses' life that would not change. In fact, that could not change. Uh, Moses, uh, God was, was where Moses could find stability. And even today, and how many years has Moses been dead? But even today, Moses is at home with God. So let's think about how Moses actually met God in the first place. And we can think of God as having a plan for Moses all along, but there's one particular point where God really makes himself known to Moses, and it's at the burning bush, which we read about in Exodus chapter 3. So here we read this. Uh, Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing yet was not consumed. And if we read on, we discover this is not just an angel of the Lord that's really in that bush, but God's presence was right there. 
And so here is this bush that is a flame, it's on fire, and yet it is not consumed. Now that, that's an interesting hint there that, um, well, perhaps you're probably ironically at home uh, as you're worshiping with us today online. So look around your home and think, if there was to be a huge fire sweep through this community, is there anything here that would go untouched? Is there anything here that would not be consumed? Is there anything that cannot be destroyed, that cannot be taken away from you? Is there anything that fire could not touch and change and destroy? Now think back to that burning bush. It was not destroyed. Why? The presence of God was there in that bush. There's a strong hint there that if we want to seek what doesn't change, what cannot be consumed, what cannot be destroyed, the only place we're going to find that is with God. Anything else, normally by fire, would be destroyed. But with God's presence, God's presence can keep safe that which would be destroyed otherwise. There's a strong hint there that if you, if you really want something in your life that is stable, that cannot be destroyed, with God, with the presence of God is where we need to seek that. Let's go on further and read further in chapter three where God tells Moses, now you're gonna, I'm sending you to Egypt, you're gonna rescue my people and lead them to the promised land. And Moses is like, well, who do I say has sent me? Uh, they're probably not gonna to listen to me, so who do I say has sent me? And Moses says, uh, God says this, uh, verse 14, chapter three, Exodus three, God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, this you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. And there we have God revealing his divine name to Moses. And it, his divine name really has this idea of existence behind it. Uh, God is I am. And that divine name actually, it's held in such honor by the Hebrew peoples uh, throughout history, the, the Jewish people, that it's never actually spoken out loud by them. And in fact, anytime you, they come across, if they're reading scriptures in Hebrew, uh, if they come across that divine name, they'll actually say Lord instead, uh, the word for Lord instead. So that's why our, most of our translations, when you find the, the word Lord all in capitals in the Old Testament, it's actually the divine name there. Uh, but again, because of that respect for the divine name, it's, we, we follow that Jewish tradition of saying Lord. Uh, so, but really God's name there has this sense of existence to it. And if you think about it, God is the only one for whom existence is part of his essence. Existence is part of God's essence in, in a way that it is for nothing and no one else. And we might scratch our heads and think about, well, what about the immortality of our souls? And doesn't that mean that our souls have been around from eternity past and will be for eternity future? Well, actually, this whole concept of the immortality of our souls, that's not a, a Jewish or Christian teaching. That is actually a Greek philosophy. It has more to do with Plato than it has to do with Jesus. Uh, so it's a Platonic idea, this idea of the immortality of the soul. Uh, the fact is we were created. The fact is that our existence is contingent. There's a big uh, theological term for you, contingent. Our existence is contingent on God having created us. In fact, the existence of the universe is contingent upon God having created us. God's existence is not contingent. And God is the only one that you can say that about. He just is. Existence is a part of his essence, is not part of ours. So there again, there's a strong hint there that if you're looking for to have a home that will protect you from the onslaught of change, there's only one who does not change and cannot change, and that is God himself. And so where is our home? Where truly was Moses' home? And where truly is Moses' home now? But with God. And that can be said for us too, that our home truly is with God. You know, every, that means that this life is basically a journey. And in this life, everything that we're doing is basically just like Moses, pitching tents. It's all so temporary. No matter how good a foundation we build to the houses that we call our homes, no matter how well we build them up and how strong they are, 
Really in the grand scheme of things, we're really just pitching a tent. It's temporary at best. And for us, it's, it's only for a season of our lives. That's what a journey is all about. It's about traveling. And there's a lot of saying hellos and a lot of saying goodbyes along that journey. And so that's something we're going to have to get used to is, as human beings is saying goodbye because life is a journey. And for the Christian, it's a journey going home. But even so, as we're looking at that journey going home, on that way home, we will need to learn to say goodbye to many things, including places, places that we might call home, places that we might think of as being where our home truly is, is, is this place. We might need to say, well, at some point, we're going to have to say goodbye to it. And, you know, I'm, I'm amazed when it's happened a few times where I'll ask somebody where they're from and, and um, have they lived anywhere else? And there's been a few who have said, I was born in this house and here I am still living in it. And meanwhile, they're elderly. And how many, you know, it could be like 90 years that they've been in that house, actually born in that house. That truly has become a home to them. Whereas for myself, I think I counted up 18 different dwelling places that I've lived in and called home. And uh, amongst those, actually, the house we live in right now, nine and a half years, that's the longest I've been any one dwelling place as a home. And I think the same is true for Sandra. So whether we've, but whether we've lived in something somewhere for nine years or whether 90 years seems a lot to me, actually, compared to the eternity with the Lord, being at home with God for eternity, compared to that, um, nine years and 90 years really isn't much different. <laughs> Both are just pitching tents at best. Part of the journey of life is at some point we have to say goodbye to places, even places that, that we might have called home. And so the question actually comes up, do we really want to invest so much into pitching a tent? So many of our lives are really invested in our homes. Maybe that's not the best course of action. Uh, places, we need to say goodbye to places. We also need to say goodbye to our possessions. And I remember seeing pictures of a motorcyclist once, and he was sitting on his Harley Davidson, and he was looking, shall we say, quite stiff, sitting on it, motionless. And he was, in fact, encased in a glass box. And that glass box was pulled behind a truck and was taken by a crane and put into the ground, and it was covered over. Yes, he wanted to be buried on his motorcycle. Now I'm looking at these pictures thinking, what a waste of a good Harley. Well, actually, I'm thinking, good thing that wasn't a triumph, because that truly would be a waste. But anyway, we won't go there. Uh, yeah, but it's like, you're not going to be riding that where you're going. <laughs> um, I'm, not, I'm an avid motorcyclist, but don't bury me on a motorcycle. I'm not going to be riding it where I'm going. You know, it's, uh, I'm, I mean, I guess this was meaningful to that gentleman, but it seems ridiculous to me. But the idea is there is we need to be ready to say goodbye to our possessions, even those possessions that maybe are so meaningful to us in the here and now. When we stand before God and recognize how meaningful Jesus Christ is to us, all those possessions, even no matter how meaningful they were to us, they won't be. They won't be. So maybe we need to get used to now saying goodbye to such things that maybe take too much bigger hold of our lives, perhaps, in the here and now. So saying goodbye to possessions. Here's another one, and this is probably the hardest, is saying goodbye to people. If, if life is a journey, and it's a journey to, to home, home with God, yeah, it does mean saying hello to people that we learn along, uh, that, that we meet along the path along that journey, but it also means saying goodbye to people. And that's, of course, hardest the, the, with, when it's people who are truly close to you. And of course, it's the hardest, too, when it's people that just seems too, too early in their lives, too soon. Th that's hard. That's difficult, but that's part of the journey is learning to say goodbye to people. So much better when, when we have that assurance that that goodbye will be followed with a hello again at some day. But people... Along that journey, we need to say goodbye. Now, here's another one that's maybe not as obvious. Uh, we say goodbye to places, possessions, people. But we also, along this journey, will need to learn to say goodbye of 
to particular ways of looking at things. And that can be just generally the way we look at things, but also maybe theologically the way we look at things. Uh, to give an example, there are those who really are raised with this idea or come into Christianity with this idea that, that every word of the Bible is to be interpreted literally and historically. And um, that doesn't leave space for the fact that the different writings of the scripture written at different times were written using different genres. And so you really need different tools in your toolkit in order to interpret them properly and well. And so what can often happen is people will come to Genesis chapter one, this account of creation, and they'll find that so at odds with what scientists teach us about how things came about and how old the earth is and things like these. And so what you find is for some people, it sets up this huge division between faith and the things that faith teaches and science and the things that science teaches. It sets up a war between them and then becomes this distrust of science. And then through that distrust of science, it can actually become quite dangerous. However, many of us have come to look at Genesis chapter one in a different light and uh, seeing it in a different way. We can see how it's reconciled between what faith teaches and what science teaches, that there's really no conflict between them. And so we can have this trust in, in science. Uh, of course, we trust in God more, but we, we, science is a good thing, and so we can trust in it. So growing and this journey of life does sometimes mean saying goodbye to old ways of looking at things even when maybe they were treasured, uh, to, treasured ways of looking at things to us. Uh, sometimes we need to say goodbye to ways of looking at things that actually uh, are wrong and sometimes just downright um, dangerous, actually. So there's something else we need to say goodbye to. Here's one last thing to think about that we, in this journey of life, as we're on our journey home to God, to be with God, another thing we need to say goodbye to is actually, um, well, these bodies. And um, I was in getting an oil change recently and uh, the mechanic was listing off for somebody else's car all the things that it needed. And I was thinking to myself, boy, I hope that's not my van he's talking about. And uh, thankfully it wasn't because he got to the end and the bill and saying to the customer, to do everything, it's gonna cost $5,800. <laughs> Yikes. And uh, so sometimes when you reach that point, it's like, oh, time for a new car. Uh, sometimes it's actually goodbye and good riddance. And sometimes that happens with people, with our bodies, that some people reach that point of saying, actually, goodbye and good riddance. I've been with a number of people in their elderly years who have said to me, Clark, I'm ready. I'm, I'm ready to go home. And I don't mean home uh, as in getting back to where I was before I went into this nursing home. I mean home. People reach that point. I remember one dear saint from this church family. Um, she had lost her home where she lived, was now in a nursing home. She had lost, basically lost her independence, lost her car, obviously, and the ability to drive, but also lost even the ability to eat. And she said to me, Clark, I'd give anything just to have a slice of toast, of all things, a slice of toast. She'd lost so much. She was ready to go home. And are we prepared to say goodbye to these, our bodies? The Apostle Paul was. Uh, let's look at that where he says, uh, says as much in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we read this, uh, verses 6 and following. So we are always confident, even though we know that while we are at home in the body, and don't we make our home in the body, uh, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not sight. Yes, we do have confidence, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. We'd rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. And actually that verse there, if you could read it in the Greek, it really stands out even more strongly. It's something like literally, uh, the word home is both away from the body and also at, uh, at home with the Lord. It's, and the, it literally reads something like, out of home, out of the body, into home with the Lord. So out of home, out of the body, into home with the Lord. This idea of uh, this body even isn't truly our home, but our home is with the Lord. Looking, of course, forward 
to the resurrection to eternal life when we're given our, our new forever homes, our, uh, the new body that the Lord will have for us at the resurrection. But even before then, our home is with the Lord. And, and so Paul was ready for that moment. At any time, the Lord could call him and he would be ready to say goodbye to this body and to be at home with the Lord. Now he goes on to say, uh, so whether we are at home or away, uh, we make it our aim to please him, that is to please God, to please Christ. For all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each may receive recompense for what has been done in the, in the body, whether good or evil. In other words, our lives in the here and now matter. And so what about this confidence that Paul could speak of? Well, we can have that same confidence before the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, you know, if we're used to walking with the Lord, if we're used to walking with Jesus, we'll have confidence standing before Jesus. And it's not because of who we are that we have that confidence. It's because of who God is and what God has done for us. That at the cross, at, at the events we remember and commemorate at the Lord's table uh, uh, regularly, these, these, are, these remind us of where our confidence lies. And it's with the Lord that we have, can have confidence that our home is with God and that we're on a journey home because of what God has done for us. The blood of Christ shed for the forgiveness of our sins. God taking that, uh, that really that consequence of sin that we should be paying and paying for it himself through Christ. Uh, God has done that for us so that we can have confidence that, yeah, we're on our way home to be with the Lord, that we can feel at home with the Lord even now and walking with Jesus even now. And we're given even greater confidence when we think of God's perspective on this, God's desires on this, God's will on this, which really comes clear in Revelation chapter 21. Let me read these verses, starting at verse three. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, see the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, see, I'm making all things new. And there we have a, a view to the future. When talk about a new beginning, it truly will be a new beginning and one that we can have confidence that God's desire is for us to be there. He wants us to be there, to, to think about the judgment seat of Christ, that we're going home actually, to have that kind of confidence. And it's because of his love, his grace, that we can think of it in that way. Do you know Jesus as your Lord and as the one who wants to save you from the consequence of your sin? Do you know him? He wants you to think of him as your home. He wants you to think of being with God as meeting your maker as actually coming home. Not something terrifying, but something beautiful and something to look forward to. God wants to make his home among us. He wants us to be at home with him. So what about the sense of home then? Yeah, home is that shelter from the onslaught of change. Well, actually, God is our true home who truly is our shelter from the onslaught of any change that can come upon us. God is our home and life is a journey. And life is a journey to home. And yeah, that means that we need to be willing to say goodbye to this, that and the other thing. It means that we'll have to say goodbye sometimes to, uh, to places, to possessions, to people, to particular ways of thinking of things, but also to these, our bodies. Being prepared to say goodbye to those, but being prepared to truly go home. So life may be a journey with many hellos and goodbyes, but let it be a journey where we hold on to things lightly, but we grasp onto God tightly, knowing that God in fact has a firm hold on us. Amen.